to mention that my PhD was both historical and archaeological study, and I've always been very interested in the relationship between written sources and field evidence, and you'll see that will uh, emerge uh, this evening. My title, as some here may have recognised, is an allusion to Frank Stenton's work on the peasants of Northern Danelaw. Now, Stenton was a brilliant and pioneering historian, a polymath who was at home dealing both with coins um, and place names, as well as Anglo-Saxon and later medieval charters. But Stenson's work on the peasants of Danelaw is now a century old, amazingly enough, and his central thesis has long been widely dismissed as clearly incorrect. So Stenton argued that a large number of the large number of free peasants found in the East Midlands in the 11th and 12th century were the descendants of Vikings who had settled there in the 10th. Few historians hold that now. So if Stenton's thesis has been so comprehensively dismissed, why am I choosing to invoke the subject of free peasantry this evening? Well, I think Stenton's contribution, as I'm going to argue this evening, was more than just a hypothesis about the settlement of Danes. He uncovered a body of material which I think remains of enduring interest because he realised that there were a series of documents produced in the century after Doomsday Book, so Doomsday Book of 1086, which cast light on the peasants, and as I will argue, the landscape of 12th century England. And the charters or grants of land um, for an area, the, the charters or grants of land for an area of Eastern England don't survive in their tens or even their low hundreds, but in their thousands, perhaps even in their tens of thousands, as we'll see. Now, Stenson wrote, um, the life of the South and most of the West of England in this age, by which he meant the 12th century, is only illuminated by sporadic groups of contemporary texts. But, he went on, from Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, there has been preserved a body of texts which cover, not inadequately, the greater part of these shires. But the original Lincolnshire charters of this age form a series unique for volume and variety. And in particular, they permit the eastern half of that county to be known with a fullness of detail, which is un uh, unobtainable in relation to any part of England. So I want to pick up on these ideas. I want to discuss um, the volume and variety of these remarkable uh, charters from the 12th century in a minute. And then come to that second point that he made about the fullness of detail. And I'm going to consider the nature, field, the nature of field evidence for land holdings in the 12th century, in particular in Lincolnshire, but then uh, consider the form of the fields and conclude what it might tell us about society in the East Midlands more generally in the 12th century. Well, let's begin with the great man himself. So here is uh, Frank Denton, a portrait uh, painted late in his life. Um, he began work on the Dane Law. Um, very early in his career, um, when he was appointed to the college, as it then was, and later the University of Reading, where he stayed uh, really for all of his career. He was able to spend a great deal, because he was in Reading, he was able to catch the train up to London very easily, and he spent a great deal of his time in the British Museum, as it then was, uh, looking at their documents, um, as well as in the public record office, as it also then was, uh, working his way through this huge body of 12th century charters. Lucky man that he had the leisure to do it. Um, he began to realise, as we've seen, that there were um, in those two repositories the most extraordinary body of material. Now, in uh, 1916, um, Stenton, and I'm not quite sure how the introduction was affected, but Stenton came um, and uh, met with uh, Canon Foster who was a canon in Lincoln Cathedral, but it's quite clear his uh, primary interests, I think, were less in religious matters and more in historical matters. And this sort of meeting uh, led to two really significant outcomes which are relevant this evening. The first was um, Stenton's work on uh, the charters of the Gilbertine Houses, and I'll talk a little bit about the Gilbertine Houses in a minute. Um, the Gilbertine Houses in Lincolnshire, um, and he realised that there was some very interesting copies of the charters which no longer existed, which had been made in the 15th century uh, in the, uh, by the Exchequer. Um, the second uh, 
outcome of this meeting was the publication in many volumes um, of uh, a series of books known as the Registrum Antiquissimum, the oldest register, um, by Foster. He was encouraged by Stenton to produce these many volumes, and he worked through both the charters which did survive, the original charters, and this register where the charters had been collected and copied out uh, by uh, Lincoln Cathedral. Um, and eventually, uh, some 300 uh, charters were published, of which about half were belonged to the 12th century. So here I've tried to bring together, to get some sort of, to give you some sort of sense of the volume of material um, that we've got. So right at the top then is the Registrum Antiquissimum um, of Lincoln Cathedral with its, uh, with its substantial body of material. Um, now Stenton, um, Stenton published himself um, uh, 500 or so charters in a book called Documents Illustrative of the Social and Economic History of Dane Law. It's known everywhere as the Dane Law Charters. Um, and he drew uh, from um, a body of material in what was the British Museum, now the British Library, as a collection, one of the founding collections called the Harley Charters. Um, and we'll look at a few, well, we'll look at a charter from the Harley Charters in a minute. Um, he also drew upon uh, records of the Duchy of Lancaster, which are uh, deposited in the Public Record Office, now the National Archives. Now, in more recent years, we've had a further publication. We've had the publication of a PhD and then the publication of a cartulary collection of charters of Alvingham Priory, of which about 700 or so belong to the 12th century. We've had, as I've already mentioned, uh, Stenton's transcription of charters relating to Gilbertine houses, about a um, hundred charters or so. so. And um, in the late 19th century, in a series of articles in uh, a journey called The Genealogists, uh, was, well, they published a series of charters uh, relating to the prior of Sempringham. Now Sempringham um, is a Gilbertine house, and the Gilbertine is quite interesting. Um, they're England's only native monastic order, in, in other words, they're the only monastic order which actually originated in England. All the other monastic orders were imports from continental Europe. And uh, Gilbert founded this order, which was an order of both monks and nuns. He founded it at Sempringham, and a number of houses were then established in Lincolnshire and also in Yorkshire and elsewhere. So we've got this body of, uh, of Gilbertine material. We've also got um, a series of charters, about 200 or so, uh, published from uh, Lincolnshire House, a Lincolnshire Monastery, uh, Abholm Priory, and there are also um, the unpublished cartularies for Bardney Abbey and Kirkstead Abbey, which I've been uh, and we're in the process of working my way through, and we are, um, indeed, we're going to get a published edition um, of the Bardney Abbey Cartulary, uh, which is uh, being prepared by, um, sorry, of the Kirkstead Cartulary, which is being prepared by Katie Dutton, and that should appear in a year or two. Um, and then we've got a whole series of other charters um, in the British Library um, from the Harley Collection. Uh, about 170, I reckon, are probably belonging to the uh, 12th century, which are unpublished by um, by um, Stenton, and probably another hundred or so in various other um, British Library um, collections. And finally, we've got about 600 charters or so um, from the Duchy of Lancaster, again unpublished, um, and I'm indebted to my colleague uh, Louise Wilkinson, who has provided me with a calendar of those uh, Duchy of Lancaster charters. Now, the reason for going through all that is to make you aware of this amazing um, collection. Um, it is really remarkable and it allows us to actually do fantastic things. When you've got a body of material, you can start doing things with it which you could not otherwise do. So we've got this fantastic body of 12th century material. Now, if I compare it with the amount of 12th century material I looked at when I was working for my PhD on Sussex, where we were lucky if there was a 12th century charter. We were really delighted if one uh, survived. Um, so here we have them in abundance, and that means we can do fun things with them. Now, because I'm in Leicester, 
Um, I thought I would give us an example, not a Lincolnshire Charter, uh, but one from Leicestershire. And this is, um, as you see, Harley and Charter 44H47. They have this sort of strange um, numbering system. Um, it's a chirograph. That means to say it's one of two copies. You can see that little jagged edge at the top where, and the word, you might be able to pick out the letters chirograph because they write the two charters and then they cut across them. And you can then, uh, if there's any question about their authenticity, you can put them together and show that they were originally uh, one. Um, it's a, it's probably dates from uh, a decade or so before uh, 1200, it's undated, um, but the, the, the evidence suggests it's probably around 1190-ish. Um, and it's recording an arbitration between the Lincolnshire Priory of Bullington um, and the parishioners of Burton on the Wolds in Leicestershire. And it records that Hugh de Burgh um, founded a chapel um, at Burton on the Wolds in the territory of Prestwold, in the parish indeed of Prestwold, and they granted the, uh, the church uh, as it became uh, to Bullington. And the problem was the parishioners were not very happy because um, Bullington, having taken over the church, was not sending anyone off to hold masses there. So um, there was a dispute, and this is the settlement of the agreement of the dispute. The priory is to hold mass there, in other words, they send a priest there to uh, hold mass. Um, a vicar there, and Hugh and the other parishioners are to come uh, to the chapel to celebrate the mass, and they're to bring with them a chalice, books, and other church ornaments. So it's a sort of rather fun insight into what's uh, going on. However, many of the charters I'm looking at are not about this sort of ecclesiastical dispute. They're actually about blocks of land, and it's um, to those that I'm going to turn. So I've numbered probably my previous slide, I numbered roughly about 7,000 charters. I reckon that probably if we take all of those, plus the ones I have not located, we're probably in the order of about 10,000 Lincolnshire charters for the uh, 12th century, a huge body of material. And I cannot claim to have seen it all yet. I'm working my way through it, but I've seen a substantial proportion of it. And what strikes me as so fascinating is that it contains remarkably vivid descriptions of the countryside. And it's the countryside and the landscape in particular and the society to which I'm going to turn in a minute. But to set the context, I need to uh, go back to 1086 to Doomsday Book and show you this slide because Doomsday Book records in Lincolnshire, and you can see Lincolnshire because it's that black bit, um, uh, it's that bit there, the most heavily shaded bit. It records large numbers of these tenants, which are called soakmen. And soakmen are very interesting because they're essentially free tenants. They are tenants who appear to only be loosely connected to a lord. And it's been pointed out that um, soakmen are often used as an alternative um, uh, to free, uh, free men. So that some, in some counties they refer to them as soapmen in, uh, and in other counties they refer to them as uh, free men. So this, so this sort of brings all that evidence together. Um, and you can see basically England seems to, particularly the Eastern England, the East Midlands, seems to have an awful lot of these free uh, peasants. So this is a very interesting category of people which Stenton was very curious about and which I think begins to tell us well, their existence and their actions through their charters begins to tell us something about certainly 12th century society and also I think about 11th century society as well. Well, how is this area organized? Well, peasants in this period had a standard holding. Not every peasant had the same, but a large proportion, the majority of the peasants in 12th century Lincolnshire appear to have had a, the same amount of land, which is referred to as a bovate um, or an ox gang uh, in English, um, bovate of land. Now, bovate um, for Lincolnshire audience is a term which I think you may not be familiar with because we here in Lincolnshire, it's referred to as a burgate. But Bovates were the term that was used in Lincolnshire, and Bovates were so familiar 
to the um, clerk at Sempringham Priory when he was writing, uh, drawing up a charter um, in the 1160s or 1170s. He records the grant of land in uh, Thrussington in uh, Leicestershire, and he refers to it as 14 bovates, but really what he meant was 14 burgates, which I'm sure is what the Leicestershire people would have used, but he was using a term which was familiar to himself. Now, Stenton um, showed that many tenants had not almost a burgate, but exactly a burgate. And historians are extremely skeptical people. And when we read about everyone holding the same amount of land, we tend to uh, be a little bit doubtful about this. We tend to assume that it's some sort of expedient, some sort of means of trying to classify more or less how much land people hold. Um, is it just a device, for example, to make rent collecting easier? We'll just assume that you've got 15 acres, you've got 30 acres, but they're more or less a bovate, and we'll call them that and collect the same amount of rent. Well, our scepticism might multiply when we see that many of these bovates consist of exactly 20 acres. It's almost too real. It's almost too neat to be real. But are we right to be quite so sceptical? Let's take a grant of land to the monks of Kirkstead Abbey um, by Basil, uh, Basilia and her son Geoffrey in 1189. So my stated charter. They sold, sale, they sold to Kirkstead 80 acres of land or four bovates. And they make it very clear how they're measuring. They're measuring this land using a perch um, of 20 feet. Often they used a perch of 18 feet, but they're being very precise, they're making it clear it's a perch of 20 feet, so measuring stick. Um, it's a perch that's often used in, uh, longer perches often used in woodland areas and marshlands. And then, they, then the charter says that if there were more than 80 acres in that land that they sold, in those four bovets that they've sold, the excess should be kept by the vendors. So clearly they're expecting the monks to go out and check exactly how much land they've been sold. And um, Basilia and her son, Geoffrey, are going to keep any surplus. But if there, were, if there are fewer than 80 acres, then um, Basilia and Geoffrey are going to make up that extra. Now that implies to me a sense of precision about measuring it. It's it's not that a bovate is approximately 20 acres. They are clearly imply it is fairly precisely 20 acres. It's a real 20 acres on the ground. Now, which, with each of those bovates went atop the house site. Um, so when in 1166, the prior, Priory of Alvingham was granted five tops, it also got four and a half bovates of land. So obviously one of those house sites only had half a bovate, but the other four uh, had full bo bovates. And probably in the early 13th century, there was another grant of nine bovates with nine tofts granted to Bullington Priory and nine tenants, nine villain tenants, unfree tenants, um, granted at a place called Strubby by Langton. Um, so you, there's a sort of neatness about the whole thing, um, which is really rather astonishing and yet seems to be uh, real. Sometimes, uh, or often, we have charters which refer to a bovate with a, a, a toft house site attached to it, or sometimes it's the other way around, a toft with a bovate attached to it. The two are clearly seen as um, going together. And the tofts seem typically to contain the house sites with the land around it, were typically a half or sometimes as much as an acre. So for example, Sybil, the wid widow of Roger of Benningworth, gave half an acre to make a new house site at a place called West Keel um, in the 1190s. So we can see a sort of shifting pattern, a well-organized landscape. That's what the documents say. Let's turn and see what the field evidence says. Does it reflect this sort of highly organized, highly structured landscape? And I want to start here with a bit of work that the Royal Commission um, did. Um, and they surveyed an area of northern Lincolnshire, of West Lindsay, um, many years ago, I think in the 1980s um, or earlier. And um, Paul Everson, who led the survey, noted that there was um, uh, limited evidence uh, or some evidence for the planning of villages. So you can see here, I better explain what you're seeing. 
On the right hand side, you're seeing Paul Everson's survey, his ground survey. And on the left hand side, you're not seeing an aerial photograph, but you're seeing a plot of the LIDAR of airborne laser survey. Um, so that it picks out um, the humps and bumps uh, very clearly. And you can see the two are in exactly the same area. Now, there are all sorts of really interesting things about um, this particular site. But, um, and I think that you can see there's an element of regularity about it. So we've got, I can pick it out, we've got a series of plots, um, from the, which has perhaps been removed, uh, running back from the road uh, there. Um, and it all appears to be reasonably regular plan. Is it planned? Well, it depends what you mean by planned. And Paul Everson himself suggests that it's been laid out over a system of fields. In other words, the ridges and furrows have determined the plots that were laid out on top. So is that planned? Well, obviously someone has decided to follow the ridge and furrow and to lay out the village, but they haven't, they haven't, it's not planned in the sense that someone's come along with a tape measure and sorted it all out. It's planned in that more general sense. And I think it's this general sense we can see planning rather than close planning. Now, close planning is very interesting because um, archaeologists are very interested in it because they often evoke the idea that it's lords that do that. Lords have the authority to go and plan villages. I don't think there's much evidence for this sort of detailed planning in Lincolnshire. I think there's a lot of this sort of planning where people have said, right, we've got some fields, ridge and fire, and we're going to lay out uh, some house sites on top of that. Um, but I don't see sort of planning de novo, if you like, planning from the fresh um, taking place. And equally, we can see here um, at a place called Southray, which we'll come back to, it's a rather interesting site. Southray, also called Thorpe, and you can see it's got um, uh, two parts, High Thorpe and Low Thorpe, um, and the left-hand diagram is the tithe map of 1821, um, and here you can see it looks a bit like a planned village, but in fact, as Paul Everson says, and I would absolutely agree, it appears to be laid out over a system of fields. And I'm going to come back to uh, Southray because Southray is much more to say about Southray because those fields are indeed extremely interesting. So we have a picture, a general picture of a village, of villages, of open fields, that's to say unfenced fields with lots of individual strips in them. And those, we count up the amount of land that the um, peasants had, they tend to have 20 acre plots. Um, generally speaking, the villages are divided into a north and a south field or an east and a west field, it's generally two field systems. So you cultivate one half of your land and you leave the other half in any one year fallow and then the following year you change it over. The strips um, were grouped into cellians, bundle of strips. Well, let's have a look. There's a bit of ribbon furrow. Um, you can see how well marked it is. You're very, I'm sure you're very familiar with Ridge and Furrow. Um, so there we are, we've got the individual strips, the individual ridges, they're grouped together to make cellions, and the cellions themselves are grouped to make uh, furlongs. And then the furlongs are gathered together to make fields, and have two of these very large fields in each village. Now, we've got this pattern and we can do something with these earthworks, as you will see. But before we come to that, I need to explain the other aspect of um, villages. And the other aspect is um, the mill. Now, the Lincoln, Lincolnshire is extraordinarily interesting because the dominant uh, unit of the way in which land was held was in villes. A mill had these two fields. The vill was the unit of agricultural organization. So the bit I've uh, uh, shaded in white here is in fact the parish of um, Snelland. But it's divided up into two villes, two separate settlements of Swinthorpe and Snelland itself. And the church itself is at Snelland. And Snelland has a north field. We've got lots of documents, so we know all about it. It has a north field and a south field. And I suggested the division between the two bills of Swinthorpe and Snelland 
runs probably where I put that dashed line. And then to the uh, east, we've got another ville, the ville of West Labby. And there are villes round about. So a parish and a ville are not the same. A parish may just have one ville in, or it may have a number of villes. But generally, the villes fit within the parish network. And of course, the point about the parish is it's an ecclesiastical division, whereas the ville is an agricultural division. Now, we know a lot about this because we know that land here was held by Lincoln Cathedral and by members of the Chamberlain family, who were themselves um, tenants of the purses. And beneath this sort of overall network, we know that there were a series of small, of small landholders who really were very, very petty uh, lords, and they described themselves as holding land of their fees. In other words, they were the sort of local lords. And yet, look at their names. People like Hent of Snelland. The fact he calls himself of Snelland implies that this is his, probably his only land, certainly his major land. Um, we've got um, Geoffrey Lund, son of Bertram of Snelland. These are people who are not huge manorial lords, they are very local people. Indeed, it seems that Hent probably lived in Snelland. Um, we, he, we've got a description of his holding, um, it's near to the church, and he's described as the patron of Snelland Church, his brother is the clerk. In other words, he has the right to appoint the priest to make the presentment. So these are people who are very local in their perspective. Any lords are very remote, having very little uh, contact with what's going on. Rather interestingly, the tithes, the tithes and money, of course, you give to the church, these are organised or recorded by Ville. So we, we've got a mention of the tithes from Swinthorpe, the tithes from Snelland, and the tithes from West Labby. Um, the, the, the Ville is the thing. Everything else seems to be secondary. Now, among the grants in Snelland were six perches of meadow. A perch is a rather difficult term because it can be used both for an area of land and also a length of land. But here we know it's describing the width of the land. So it's actually a strip of land which comes back. And um, some years ago, I wrote a paper because there were some very odd things in Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire is not the place. There were some very odd things in Lincolnshire because there are lots of these very, very long strips of meadowland. Um, so uh, this is an example which I mentioned, which is a place called Grainthorpe, which um, has uh, uh, areas of meadow out in the marsh, uh, 10 perches wide running in length from uh, Gataroon to Sandwath, which is the name survives in Sandwath House. I don't know exactly where they were, but I suspect that they were these uh, uh, strips here. And we can work out how long they were. They were enormously long, as you can see, 980 metres long, almost a kilometre long, um, depending on exactly the size of the perch they're using, or 880 metres long. We don't know exactly where they were, but I think they are in that area. So these enormous um, narrow bands of land, only a few perches wide. And this uh, pattern um, is quite common in the marshland and has left this extraordinary enduring pattern um, here out at Salt Fleetby, which is a little away from Grainthorpe, um, with a series of long, narrow uh, bands of land. And that's medieval in origin, pictures which pick it out as absolutely medieval in origin. Uh, particularly, I'll point out, if I can find it, find an example, you might be able to see down there the sort of little a little sort of curve at the end of those strips. So that's the curve which you get when the plows, of, the plow team is brought round, it's referred to as an unarchal curve. So that's, that's medieval in origin. And it's not, these are not untypical. So right up in the north of Lincolnshire, we've got in Redbourne, a reference to uh, land uh, there in the middle of the 12th century, running from the island of Tunstall as far as the river, being 90 metres wide, but running for a distance of 1.6 kilometres, so over a mile uh, in length. Um, just one further example, when I was doing some work uh, very recently on the Witham Valley, the Witham Valley is the, the valley bottom is the white bit, you can see it's all divided up between a series of uh, manors, 
but um, there is reference to uh, an area of, um, of Meadowland right up there. Um, and it's uh, 1400 meters long. It's right up by the river because the best land is up by the river. So the med best meadowland is right up near the river where I think the flooding has sort of raised the land. Uh, the rest is sort of nasty, peaty, uh, reedy stuff. And it's common land. They distinguish the common land, which is not divided up, from the good meadowland up by the river. Um, so the good land they are concerned with dividing up in this way. And these strips of land, these very characteristic strips of land, are referred to in the documents as dales, um, which is derived from the Old English dal, or the similar word in Old Norse, meaning dale, which is a share or a portion. So everyone's getting a share of these rather good bits of land, and the rest is left uh, for common. That's great, very interesting because at Hanworth, which is where I put that red arrow, Hanworth, uh, they imply very clearly that the amount of animals, the number of animals you have on the common land on the really wet part is related to the amount of meadowlands, the width of the meadowlands that you have got. So there's almost a mechanical um, approach to dividing up the resources. And what is extraordinary is this not only found in the meadows, but it's also found in the arable as well. So this is an area just to the east of uh, Lincoln. The city of Lincoln is just to the west. And here there's a re reference in a uh, 12th century document to a longa cultura, a long furlough. And it tells you where the beginning of it is and where the end of it is. Um, the beginning of it is at the boundary um, of uh, the fields of Lincoln, which is where I've indicated it on the uh, left hand side of that arrow. And the right hand side, uh, the end of it, is the place called Halliwell, the Holy Spring. Uh, and there's only one place um, that that can be. It must be on that line which runs uh, down there on the right, because that's the only watercourse. It may be a bit further north, uh, but it's going to be on that line. So, what's that distance? That's 460 meters. So, that longer culture is almost half a kilometre long. And we can uh, use numerous other examples. And here we are up on the uh, Lincolnshire Wolds, a grant to Alving and Priory um, of two bow baits, each of 20 acres and two tofts. It's exactly what we've seen already. And they tell us how wide it is. And because we know how much land there is, we can work out how long each of those strips of land were. 475 metres, half a kilometre um, long. And um, there's another chart of about 1200, which gives us other details. In this case, the on the south side of the village, it's very specific, it gives you enough details to work it out, because it says it extends from the road as far as the field of Rothwell, that's the next door bill. And you can work out, because you know how wide it is, and you know how large an area was enclosed, it's 900 metres long enormously long bands of land. These are not like these little ridge and furrows, which are re relatively short. These are enormous. And on the north side of the bill, um, it runs from Caister as far as uh, the headed land, meaning the headland, 1.8 kilometers long. Um, and if you go and put this on a map, you end up, well, you've got, uh, it's about 980 meters to, um, uh, to the, um, the boundary to the south and if you go uh, if you put on 1800 meters it extends right the way up the hill from the valley um, uh, where the uh, the village of Cable is situated. <laughs> now what is the sense of this? Why do you have these enormously long pieces of land? What is the purpose of this? Well I will come well perhaps I should answer that question now. I think it is it's about equality. I think it is about showing that you're getting a bit of the good land and a bit of the bad land. So the good land is down in the valley at Cable. It gets worse as you go up the slope uh, onto the hill. It becomes more chalky, horrible land. But everyone has a bit of the good and a bit of the bad because they're all getting one of these long strips running uh, up the slope. And you can see that your neighbours have got the land. So this is very, very different from the ridge and furrow um, that we are used to. And it's not ubiquitous. It doesn't occur everywhere in Lincolnshire. It occurs in a number of places and it occurs both in arable and it occurs also in meadow. It's all about showing how much 
you've got and what is and that it's absolutely fair. Everyone is getting a bit of the good and a bit of the bad by having these long strips of land. It's nothing to do with ploughing. Ploughing that distance, you have the plough team cannot plough for 1.8 um, kilometre, 1.8 kilometres without stopping. It pull-ups and will be exhausted. It's nothing about ploughing. It's just so I think about equality. But it's very, very distinctive. Now, this uh, this feature of long lands, as it's been termed, um, has been noted in a few other places. It hasn't been noted in Lincolnshire before, but it has been noted in Northamptonshire by David Hall, who did some fantastic work. So this is his map of Northamptonshire and um, his atlas, and all the grey uh, bits are um, areas, are townships, villes, which have these long lands in them. And uh, on the uh, left-hand side, the right-hand side, sorry, I've redrawn one of his diagrams um, to show um, what, how it actually worked in practice. So this is a two-field uh, two bill. So there's the north field, there's the south field. And you can see all the strips, as they later were, um, ran north, south, and south, and they ran east-west to the north of that road. And what Hall argues, and I think it's absolutely persuasive, is that subsequently these very long lands were divided up into more conventional, shorter strips. But originally they ran right the way through. Now, if we were to look at that, um, perhaps we can take a further example, because Yorkshire has it too. There you can see in, um, in Great Kelp in uh, East Yorkshire, we've got exactly the same system, these enormously long bands of land. And in West Yorkshire, Towton, the site of the uh, Civil War battle, incidentally, exactly the same thing. Um, it's even reflected in the pattern of the enclosed fields. And this is Hall's uh, diagram by which he interprets what it was originally like. So it's a Northamptonshire feature, it's a Lincolnshire feature, some areas of Lincolnshire, and it's a Yorkshire feature. And uh, indeed, it occurs even in very broken areas, such as on the Yorkshire Wold. This is Warren, the street near the famous excavated village of Warren Percy. And here, uh, Hall has plotted all these aligned strips and draped them across um, a digital terrain model of the landscape and show that in spite of this broken landscape, we've got these aligned strips, these long lands, as they referred to. So I suppose we shouldn't have been surprised to find them in Lincolnshire. But I want to investigate that in a minute. But before we do so, now we can come back to Southray. And now we can see, well, of course, that's exactly what I've already shown you. We have this area of aligned strips, not everywhere, but certainly in that uh, western part of Southray. And then with the villages being imposed on top of that pattern. Well, let's now turn to the field evidence. Can we actually find evidence? I talked about the documentary evidence, I talked about the map evidence. Can we actually find evidence for this? Well, it would be marvelous if we could because, but the problem is that the ploughing has been hugely destructive. And we have to go to those areas where the ridge and furrow still survives. So I want to start here um, just near Grantham. Um, this is Belton Park, Belton House, that National, uh, National Trust property, if you know it. A place called Londonthorpe, and I've indicated the boundary of the bill of uh, Londonthorpe with a dotted line at the top. And there you can see exactly what David Hall showed with all those aligned strips running right the way across from the river with them on the west side and right the way across, indeed, out beyond the LIDAR plot. I can pick them up on aerial photographs running for 1.6 kilometers. All these aligned strips. Subsequently, it seems they were probably broken up into these smaller, more conventional um, strips, but they are all aligned in this way. And there's no topographical reason, it's almost flat, there's no topographical reason why they should have been all aligned in that way. Now, when does this pattern date to? Well, the park at Belton uh, House was formed in 1690, but might have been preceded by an earlier park. So what is being preserved here under the park, and you can see a lot of the park features, of course, running across the top of Margus Avenue, running north-south there, and another one running at the top east-west. Um, what is being preserved is a pre-late uh, 17th century landscape, landscape um, before the late 17th century, and that's been preserved in the park. 
Um, another example. Now, here we are at Beckingham, um, and it's near Newark. And what survived here is it survived because it was turned into an army training camp sometime before 1940. And the army don't want to plow up the land because they want to use it for training. And so this landscape of Ridge and Faro has been preserved. And there you can see exactly the same thing. I put it with dashed lines, the headlands, the bits at the edge of the strips. But you can see the Ridge and Faro running across them. I put with the double headed arrows so that you can pick those out. So um, I think you can see that we can find in the landscape clear examples of these long lands. Well, I've got one more bit to the jigsaw to put uh, in place, and then I think we can actually begin to interpret what we're seeing here. And that is the common land. So common land is land over which the tenants of the bill have rights to graze. Now, during the course of the 12th century, and certainly by 1235, when the king passes the statute of Merton, lords, manorial lords, sought to get more and more control over common land. They asserted their rights to charge uh, tenants, to take dues from tenants for grazing. But Stenton, again, drew attention in a paper published in 1918, another paper he wrote uh, on uh, Dane law, that um, the grants of commons, uh, of common land made to the monks of Haverhall in the 1130s, it's not just the Lord that's giving those rights of common to the, the priory, but it, the Lord has to also say that it is a grant given with the men of have a home. It's given with the assent of the soakmen, those free men of have a home. In other words, they have possession of the land. They have rights in it. It's not just the lords who do so. And there's another grant which Stenton oddly, uh, oddly missed nearby at Ruskingham, uh, Ruskington, um, in which, again, um, the land is granted to have a home for 40 animals. And it's given by the Lord of Ruskington with his son and with the men of Ruskington. So those men who have their rights that right is being acknowledged. Now, I don't think it's coincidence that all of those charters, which Stenton cited, which I've mentioned, all belong to the 1130s, because I think within a few decades, those rights have been swept away. The lords have sought to assert their control on it. Now then, can we bring all this material together? What does it all mean? Now, Frank Stenton was very cautious about doing so, but I think we're in a better position to do so now than he was because of our better understanding of 12th century society. I've said that at the heart of any interpretation must be the realization that in the 11th and 12th century, it's the villes, the group of people who manage that, those open fields, which are important. It's not the parish and it's certainly not the manor because this area seems to be very, very weakly under the control before 1200 of manorial laws. So it's the, the vill that's important. Indeed, within any, within any vill, there might be a whole series of different manorial lords who uh, had the rights there. We've seen these petty lords at Snelland, for example. So these, these open fields have to be managed cooperatively. It's no good one person deciding to set their animals to graze and someone else planting wheat next to it. You've got to agree on an agricultural system. Um, and it seems to me that um, this means that the peasants are drawn together to cooperate. Peasants are the important people. They haven't got the Lord, any Lord, who's powerful enough to say, right, this is what's going to happen. You agree. It's they who are agreeing, peasants, the peasants of the bill. And the implications of this are profound because it also probably means that the way that the land was divided up into bovates is not being imposed by the Lord, but is being a matter arising from the peasants, but those long lands also are decisions by the peasants. They're the people who are concerned about how the land is divided up. They are choosing to divide it up in this conspicuously fair way. Now, the way they chose to do it has ended up being, as we've already seen, extraordinarily regulated, almost egalitarian. I don't think it's I don't think it's equal, but it's almost egalitarian. There are lots of people with bow base, the standard unit. 
And actually some peasants were rich and held more and some were less uh, wealthy and held fewer. But many, many, perhaps the majority, held one by bit of land in the 12th century. There was abundant pasture for the livestock uh, in the marshlands and heaths and in the wolds. But the meadowland, meadow which is being used to produce hay, was also carefully managed in these long strips or dales, giving every owner a share of the marsh. And the charters make clear that, that those rights of meadowland connected with the number of animals that you could have grazing, which is known as stinting, on the common land. And we've seen also that this, the soapmen, it's the people of the bill who have control over that common land. One of the people, one of the parties have control over that land in the early 12th century. So it seems to be that it's these free men who are making the decisions, who are making, working out how to organize the, this land. The aim appears to be to give everyone a proportion of good and poor land, to give them roughly equal shares and to make this manifestly fair. Now in the end, we have to ask, why were the community of the bill, why was the community of the bill so dead set on, I'm gonna call it fairness, uh, for the sake of argument. Why were they so concerned to make it conspicuously fair? And I puzzled over this. And to me, it, the most convincing explanation seems to be one which that the men of the bill, the people of the bill, depended on community cohesion. They depended upon everyone agreeing to cooperate. And this could only be achieved if everyone was brought in and agreed and agreed on the system. There were no lords to to impose this. They lacked the coercive power that manorial lords might later have um, applied. And therefore they required cooperation to make the agriculture work. And yet it's very odd. The agriculture seems to, sorry, the cooperation seems to have stopped with the, the agriculture. It didn't extend to the villages. The villages, as we've seen, were not particularly planned. They didn't, they didn't seek to control the plan of the villages. This was not a communistic society, but one which was working, I think, in a pragmatic way. It ensured that everyone had a share in the village, a reasonable holding, and therefore everyone saw it as in their interest to cooperate. But what we are seeing in the course of the 12th century is it being gradually replaced by a rather more active and assertive manorial lordship. Manorial lords are getting their hands on things, they're beginning to assert control. And that's what's so interesting about this collection of charters, we are seeing that process uh, happen and they're beginning to assert first of all over common land and later in other fields. So what we've seen in Lincolnshire seems to me to have much wider implications. Why for example over many areas of England do 13th century rentals, so rentals for the following century, have so much land in standard sized holdings in the Bovate or the Burgate? Well it may be that there was this system of equal division um, which occurred elsewhere, but which we do not have the documentary evidence to support. Why were the long lands in Northamptonshire and Yorkshire as well as Lincolnshire? Well, it appears to be that this concern with conspicuous uh, fairness, you've got to not only be fair, but seen to be fair. And um, it seems to me that what we've seen in Lincolnshire is not isolated. We probably should be seeking to see if there is similar evidence in Leicestershire and maybe by careful examination of the documents such as survival and the landscape, we may be able to find something similar. Certainly we can find it in the uh, Norfolk Fens where again, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but basically the, the land to the Southwest was gradually inned and enclosed uh, moving on from beyond that red dotted line. And you can see how they did it. They did it by creating these long uh, strips of land. So while I'm, while I'm not saying that this pattern of long, long lands was ubiquitous in Lincolnshire or indeed in the whole of England, I'm arguing that it's make, it provides us with a means of beginning to understand the landscape, of beginning to understand certain features of the landscape which were otherwise inexplicable and perhaps provides us with an explanation. We need to think how peasant communities might have chosen to shape their landscape in this way, which preserves the cohesion of the social group, but allows for change in the use of resources. And I believe that by approaching the landscape of the East Midlands in this way, we know we may be able to approach the thinking which is behind this 
these pre-manorial peasant communities. Thank you.